Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Writing Contract Specifications to Achieve Environmental Compliance. I'm Dave Jenkins, your host for today. Um, I'm going to change this up a little bit. Um, if you have a question as we go, since we don't have too many folks um, showing up here, go ahead and just uh, unmute and uh, ask a question or put your hand up or something and uh, try to deal with it as we go. All right, so again, I'm Dave Jenkins. Um, I'm a certified professional erosion sediment control currently president of the Pacific Northwest chapter of the IECA. Um, I recently retired, actually eight months ago from 22 years at Port of Seattle as erosion control stormwater engineer. And I just went back a month ago to help out, help close out a project for a couple months, uh, got bored, I guess. And then prior to that, what I spent three years with Department of Transportation as their first statewide erosion control coordinator where my uh, primary duty was to develop the state's first contractor erosion sediment control lead certification training. All right, enough about me. So I'm going to start off with a few definitions here. Uh, contract permit and specifications and apologize if this is all review, there might be some review here for a few of you. Uh, so a contract is a binding agreement between two or more persons or parties that is legally enforceable. A permit is an official document giving someone authorization to do something. And in this presentation, I'm going to primarily focus on the Washington State um, Construction NPDES permit. So in this case, then, the authorization to do something would be to discharge stormwater. And then specifications detail work, materials, and installation required to complete a project. A few concepts uh, to keep in mind. Um, contracts are all about communication, communicating expectations, and communicating with uh, everybody involved to make sure that they all have similar, at least, expectations. Uh, you can, there's a couple ways to write specifications. They can be pres prescriptive or performance-based, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. I tend to, with environmental specs, I tend to be more prescriptive than performance-based uh, because contractors generally aren't as up on environmental construction as they are on, say, concrete or structural. Also, means and methods. Uh, these are the standard methods used by a contractor to perform, perform work. Um, and uh, Sometimes there's a conflict between being prescriptive and a contractor's means and methods. So touch on that a little bit. Uh, I was told early in my career that you can look at contracts two ways. They're the Bible or they're, they're a guide. So they're either it's black and white, this is what the contract says, no deviation, or it's the starting place. Um, it's, it's what you want, but there's some flexibility. And then lastly, uh, another thing I learned, somebody told me years ago, but I also learned on my own that contract specifications are written in blood. So no matter how good a specification is, uh, it's, there's going to be flaws in it and you'll find out pretty quickly and you'll end up changing the specifications for a later project. All right, why is this not? There we go. Uh, again, this is going to be primarily based on the uh, water quality section 402 NPDES permit for state of Washington, but the concepts should be transferable to most, most or all permits. These are just a few of the permits that um, I probably, I think I'm talking a little bit about each of these. All right, what's the difference between a permit and a contract? Uh, permits are in this case are statewide. So they cover all project types or as many project types as is feasible um, and, and as many uh, situations as feasible. So permit has to be somewhat, <clears throat> excuse me, general because of that and because it uh, permitted addresses various audiences. So designers, permittees, contractors, and such. Um, a contract is project specific. So it's written to build one project 
and the more specific, the better. So an example, uh, and I like to try to keep the frame of mind of uh, you know, your personal life when you're thinking about this, uh, because our lives are full of contracts, verbal, written, um, every day, we're doing some kind of contract. So for example, um, your, your kid comes to you and says, uh, I'd like to borrow the car tonight. So here's the difference. Permit language is, you're permitted to use a car. You should be home by 10 to avoid possible penalties. Uh, fill the car with gas if practicable, and you should call a parent to report lateness. Um, so number two, a, a kid might think if you say should and possible, it's, um, that means maybe 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, and you're probably not going to get a penalty. So it's really loose. As opposed to a contract, child may use a car. Child shall be home by 10. Uh, the uh, gas tank shall be full as measured by the gas gauge. Shall pay for all tickets. Shall call the parent um, if they might be late, things like that. And notice uh, on six, the child uh, Child shall immediately call a parent if impaired. The parent will park a suitable distance away and not punish the child, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very clear, very concise. Um, expectations are very clear here. So what is the secret of environmental compliance when writing specs? Understand what the permit is requiring and translate it to contract language. So a few things about contract language. Number one is, uh, this is your Latin lesson for today. Contra proferentum means against the offerer. So this is a legal principle related to contracts that if a contract is not clear um, and there's a dispute, then the court is gonna lean toward the person that uh, in this case, a contractor, as opposed to the owner who wrote the contract. So it has to be clear. And also uh, reasonable interpretation. Again, if the contract's not clear and there's a dispute, and goes you go to court or arbitration, uh, the arbitrator or judge is going to use the reasonable interpretation rule. And uh, generally what I've found is if you're not clear, um, you're probably going to be on the losing end of a dispute. Words matter in a contract. So if you want the contractor to do something, you tell them they shall, uh, or in some cases must, I think federal contracts are using must more than shall. But either, either way, they mean the same thing, you shall do it. And the owner will do something. So contractor shall build this and the owner will pay them for it. Um, should should never be in a contract under any circumstance because as I pointed out in the contract language with the child borrowing the car, it's open to interpretation. You can't, well, let me back up. You can say should if it's used in this type of situation, should the liner be torn, the contractor shall immediately repair, et cetera, et cetera. You can use may in a contract, uh, but be very careful. Um, in this example, we told the contractor they may be able to slip line a, an existing leaking stormwater pipe across a roadway to get water from the left side of this drawing to the right side. Turned out that was not possible for many reasons, and uh, we ended up paying to do a lot of extra work related to uh, moving water um, other than using a pipeline. So that was um, that was a flaw on our part. Some do's and don'ts. Um, if you are not clear, or if you add stuff after contract award, you have to pay for it. These are a few of my personal opinions here, plans and specs. Don't put specs on plan sheets. Um, this is really common. Uh, the order of, um, not order of preference, the legal order in a contract, the specs come before the drawings. But if you put specs on the drawings, in addition to having your spec, specs in a book, and there's a difference between the two, you're going to have problems. So 
unless you've got a really small contract where you know all of your specs can go on a plan sheet uh, along with your contract drawings uh, i would never suggest putting specs on drawings and this is really popular with the tesc erosion control stuff but there'll, the, there'll be one whole sheet with that stuff um, we like to have a separate very clear corrosion control spec rather than put it on plans. Um, if you can avoid recycling specs from a past project, that is probably going to save you in the long run. Um, a lot of times reusing specs from another project, you'll miss things and uh, end up with some change orders. So I, I prefer if there's time to start with a master spec and redo it each time, unless a project is clearly the same doing a house, all you do is houses, for example, everyone is the same, uh, same idea. So maybe you can use the same, same spec all the time. And don't repeat, uh, environmental uh, designers like to repeat words like, and it seems like it's the more we say it, the more con the contractor is gonna understand, but that's not how it works. You just need to say it once and say it clearly. Be very concise. So the fewer words that communicate what you need to communicate, the better. For example, this, um, and, and all of these examples are taken from contracts that I've worked on. Now, fortunately, some of my, I didn't write. So this was in a Superfund cleanup project, and it's an explanation of offsite disposal rule. It's everything there is to know about the offsite disposal rule put in a contract, and this is what it means to the contractor. It means nothing in the contract. Um, you know, it's it's good information, it's interesting information, but what you need to do is um, translate all of that into language that the contractor needs. So in this case, it all needs to go out. Another example. Uh, this is from same project actually. So it's possible this disturbance of historical Native American materials may occur. Uh, a 10 to one hour orientation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is good information, but it's it's actually in three parts. So the first one is really a note to the designer of the project uh, that tell the designer this could happen. You need to make sure it's addressed in the contract. The third thing is, um, well, let's see, what is the third thing? You're telling, uh, okay, this is to the engineer that personnel must be made aware of certain things. The only thing that makes uh, a difference to the contractor is this one. The excavation crew shall attend a one hour, one hour on-site orientation held by the site archeologist. So all the contractor needs to know. That way they can bid it. They know they've got 30 people. That's 30 hours or you know, 30, 40 hours of non-productive time they need to put in their bid. They need to be aware of. If you want it, you need to say it. So uh, this is pretty common. Things like lawns and, and lawn and plants should be watered by the contractor as needed to keep them in healthy growth. And then for trees, that means seven gallons per watering, etc. If you want seven gallons per tree, then you need to write it in there. So between June 1st, August 31st, example, for example. Each tree shall receive seven gallons. Each shrub shall receive three gallons of water weekly. This is biddable. Contractor knows if there's 3,000 trees and shrubs, it's going to take this much water. I need a water truck. Uh, I need to water continually, whatever. You can bid that. A little bit about permit language. Generally, and, and I would say more forcefully than generally, um, you can't insert permit language into a contract as is and expect compliance. And here's why. These are the kind of words that are in permits. If possible, minimize, necessary, in a manner, as needed, when practical. It's all good legal. Uh, legal they're legal words that provide wiggle room for the uh, permit issuer but they don't belong in a contract. In addition, if you read through, say the construction general NPDES permit, 
much of the text in the permit is actually for the owner or for a designer. It's not really specific to a contractor, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Now you can reference permits, so this is this is done frequently. Um, if you if you have a series of permits, you can put them into a contract um, whole and include them as reference documents, and they're contractually binding. Although because of the way permits are written, uh, you may or may not get compliance by doing <clears throat> excuse me doing that. So here's one of my favorite examples. Um, this is taken from the permit, one of the permits, stabilize access points with Corey Spall's crushed rock or equivalent BMPs to minimize tracking sediment onto roads. So what does minimize mean? Whose definition of minimize do we use? Um, you know, one person's chunks of dirt on the road um, is a minimize, somebody else's is I don't want to see anything, which is actually what mine is. So for example, uh, to translate that, what's the risk of having sediment track out? So on your project, if you're in a uh, wet season and you're doing a very large earthwork project, you're going to have sediment track out. Uh, it just is what it is. It's a high risk for that. So you need to take that into account. If the risk is high, then in my opinion, you're going to need at least one tire wash, um, good solid tire wash. And you need to determine what your measure is going to be so the contractor knows, even with the tire wash, um, that this much going on the road after the tire wash is too much. So here's the Port of Seattle spec that I wrote years ago. Um, At no time shall mud debris or visible sediment be allowed outside the project. So it's a very difficult standard, visible sediment. If I can see it, you're tracking it. Um, that gives everybody a bid, a bid point and an expectation uh, understanding. This is what's expected. Now, if you're doing a whole bunch of stuff and I still see stuff on the road, I'm gonna cut you slack, but that's the standard point. And, and actually this is achievable, I've learned over the years. I don't recommend it for everybody, but uh, another way to do this is say a smaller project or there's a lot of asphalt. Um, require haul trucks shall stay on asphalt at all times. So trucks stay on asphalt, get loaded out on asphalt and move out. Uh, contractor shall install a gravel employee parking lot, for example. Now these are prescriptive. We're telling the contractor exactly what to do, um, which I've found in many cases is the only way that you, you're going to ensure compliance. Now, uh, Port of Seattle, most of the work I did was at SeaTac International Airport. So it's a fixed facility surrounded by businesses and residences and everything ends up in a creek. So with the strict permit requirements, there is no room for error. So um, we use a lot of, have used a lot of prescriptive specs like this. Oops, what's going on here? Another way to do this, and this would be a performance. Um, tire wash system has met the performance criteria when there is no mud at paved or stabilized exit of the wash system. Tires under carriage of trucks and equipment visibly clean. So that is a nicely written performance, performance spec. And an example, I like to throw pictures in here. Uh, it's too many words. There you go. All right, here's another one. Uh, permittee must design and construct cut and fill slopes in a manner to minimize erosion. There's that minimize again. What does that mean? Can I have erosion? How much erosion can I have? If I fill a wetland, is, uh, if, if I fill a wetland halfway instead of full, is that, have I minimized erosion? So, you know, it's just open to interpretation. Now, I just want to point out the language here. Permittee must design and construct. Contractors don't design stuff unless it's a design build um, contract or an alternative contract. The owner designs and puts the contract out. So this is what, what I was saying earlier. The permit is written for a lot of different people and you have to kind of deconstruct and, and figure out what's being told to, to who or whom 
and what you need to write into the contract for the contractor. So applicable, applicable practices for minimizing erosion include um, a bunch of things here. But again, the contractor doesn't have control over these things. Uh, reducing continuous lengths of slope with terracing and diversions, reducing slope steepness. Um, they can control the track walking, but the other two, these are design issues. So this is kind of a mixed, mixed bag here. So here's a typical fill. Um, you know, fill it, get it to rough grade, um, trim it, and hydro seed it. But that's not what I want to, uh, to have to meet that permit requirement. What I want is to put in the contract no more than 30 feet vertical, and I'll write a, write a spec for this, but I don't want to have more than 30 feet vertical uh, slope uh, before I track walk and spray, in our case, bonded fiber matrix on it. Um, I want to have at least 10 foot wide benches at each fill lift, so every 30 feet. And I want to have one or 2% positive drainage away from the fill slope face at all times. And I want to place a burn at the top of the fill uh, at all times to prevent any water from going over. So these are what my expectations are. I work with the designer. And then we write a spec, contractor shell track walk and hydro seat slopes. When 30 feet vertical fill is placed, minimum 10 foot wide benches shall be placed at each lift. A positive drainage and soil berm shall be maintained at the top of the fill slope at all times. So this is what that looks like in a plan sheet. Again, this is not a contractor's decision to do, to do this. This has to be, uh, this is designer engineer's issue. This is what it looks like. So you can see on the lower, uh, the lower slope, the grass is dry. It's it's been in place a long time, and then green as we go up to the top, and actually a rock cap on the, the very top. And here's the berm at the top of the slope, which was made as we filled. This was maintained uh, continually. Another project, Tidal River Bank construction. Uh, habitat restoration. So what is the issue that we have to deal with? Well, we don't want to be digging in the water. So we're reconstructing the slope uh, down to a certain elevation. I think in this case, we were down to plus two, plus two elevation. Um, you don't want to work in water and you know, most times of the year you're not allowed to anyway. So looking at the tides, we see that as, um, we do have a period of time, a few hours, where we can construct out of the water. Now, how do you put that in a contract? This is from a Habitat and a Superfund project that we did. A designer came up with this. Maintain two foot vertical elevation or six foot horizontal separation uh, shall be required between the tide level and all excavation and backfill. So this is a clear direction to the contractor. They, they're able to take this and go, okay, well, how are we gonna do this? Um, if, if we have to maintain a two-foot vertical, we have to have a zero or lower tide. Um, looking at the tide chart, we may only have four hours uh, to work before the tide's coming back. So how are we going, going to stage that work? Um, you know, in, in the case of these projects, contractor figured out, I can only work a, say a 25 or 30 foot uh, width of slope from plus two up to the top or above plus 12 where the high tide is. Um, so as soon as the tide's going out, they're working down the slope. They're doing the slope at the bottom or the work at the bottom while they have a zero tide. And then as the tide's coming back, they're finishing the slope pulling out. So a very clear expectation. Another one that's come up, um, Port of Seattle does a lot of marine construction, seaport construction, and occasionally has to demolish a building. Um, around the seaport, we have a lot of seagulls, which are covered under the Migratory Bird Act. And they like to nest on these old uh, building roofs. And we got caught by this, it seems like every couple of years, but uh, I wrote a spec a few years ago to address this. So out of 
the Migratory Bird Act. There's pages and pages of stuff. But for our project, this is all that matters is we need to keep birds from nesting and laying eggs. So, um, and we need to provide a time frame that we're going to take care of it, the port, and then the contractor is going to take it over, uh, having to do with contractor mobilizing and that sort of stuff. So, owner will provide bird watch services up, up until 30 days after contract execution, and then the contractor takes it over. Uh, contractor is responsible for preventing birds from nesting, and then it tells what they need to do, inspect daily. Nests that do not contain eggs and not in possession of a bird can be destroyed. If there's an egg or if it's in possession without eggs, you can't touch it. Uh, you can't demolish the building for a couple of months. And then if the contractor doesn't do these things, then they're going to be responsible for any associated costs or delays um, since they didn't do what we told them to do. So that's, um, that's another example of taking a very big permit and distilling it down to what's important for your job to meet the requirements of the permit. And went faster, I talked a little too fast, I think, but I do have a bunch of bunch more examples uh, that I can go into if you guys wanna keep going here. Um, does anybody have a question? You can unmute if you want, we don't have too many folks here. Okay, well, let's do some spec exercises. Uh, this isn't really, well, this is just another example. This is a prescriptive uh, constant problem with contractors, old sweepers leaking. They don't uh, keep the door seals clean. They don't repair them and they're leaking all over the place. So I finally got, uh, got uh, fed up with it and wrote this spec. No time shell debris. Hopper seals, um, debris hopper seals leak debris and or liquids. Liquids, not the best language, but it gives me something that I, if I tell the contractor once or twice to uh, fix it and they don't, I just tell them, look, get it off, get it out of here, get another one. Another, uh, this is an example from a cleanup job that we did. Uh, I don't know why this was written in, but Stockpile cover minimizes wrinkles and provides a straight placement. I have no idea why this is necessary uh, and why this is put in the contract. Why a stockpile cover should be perfect, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe, maybe there was some reason for it, but it, other than the minimize, which is, you know, the, what are we actually saying here? So let's say it is important, install a stockpile cover in a manner that minimizes wrinkles. Stockpile cover shall not have wrinkles, period. Um, this is something that I see with environmental specs pretty frequently. Um, use, use electrical power where possible for activities such as, um, do, you, do you want them to use electrical power or don't you? You know, if, if it's important for you to reduce emissions on your project, um, and you don't want them running a diesel generator constantly to do that. And if there's a way to tie into uh, shore power, then write it in the contract. Contractor shall use shore power at all times. Generators shall not be allowed. Here's one of those um, teaching moments. Use cleaner, use of cleaner engines or use cleaner engines, cleaner fuel, cleaner diesel control tech technology on diesel powered equipment with engines greater than where practicable. Uh, again, if this is important to you, then write it in there. Contractor shall do this and this and this um, with engines greater than 50 horsepower. This is um, not, a, not a bad one. Should seeded areas fail to germinate, contractor shall rework, refertilize, etc. I don't like the adequate germ germination. Um, you know, I, I would put uh, for, for the Port of Seattle, we have 85% coverage requirement for vegetation. So receive such areas as described above until 85% coverage 
is affected by. Portions of this contract are very unique and under strict control of several regulatory agencies. It is understood this work is so designed and these requirements are so stated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, useful in a contract, uh, not so much. Hey, Dave, this is a uh, skip. Uh, could you go back to that seed one you had a couple of minutes, a couple of slides ago? Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, so uh, on the 85% cover, I think what's important there too is the time frame, right? So are we looking at one week, one month, one year? I mean, it just as 85% cover. Um, it's, it's when the contractor comes back and says, okay, we're done. Mm -hmm. And I go inspect it to, you know, like punch list. It's like, um, let me, I'll, I'll tell you if you're done or not. You know, or what, what's all these uh, bare patches here? You know, that's not 85% cover. Is, is that kind of what you're asking? Well, I was just thinking that, that what is, what's the time frame that they're responsible for? Is it, is it, oh. or, and maybe it's just, well, you would think that you'd want 85% cover within a certain time frame, not, you know, five years from now, but you right. want it within a certain period. Right. Um, we don't write a time frame into the contract. We just say 85% cover. And again, the port is pretty prescriptive. So uh, we did a, uh, the center runway rebuild a few years ago at the airport. So it's complete ground up, rip it out, rebuild it uh, with shoulder work. So we had in a given time, we had two or 300 acres of disturbed soil. Um, this was done in summer. We knew we had to have grass before the rainy season started. So we put in the 85% cover, but in the contract, we also made provision for watering. Um, and not to, this would be a different presentation, but how we do, how we do seeding out at the airport is we, we don't use blankets for many reasons. We only use bonded fiber matrix. Uh, and in the case of this runway, we put, uh, we put 3000 pounds per acre of bonded fiber matrix with seed and fertilizer down. When that was dry, we shot just bonded fiber matrix over the top. So it was expensive, but it guaranteed we were gonna get quick growth. Um, and then we watered it over summer. We paid the contractor to water. So it, that's how we do it. Um, if it makes sense for you to put in a time frame, uh, or you know, like a warranty period or anything like that. Right. Yeah, it's just not something that, that we do. That was the long answer, I guess. Any other questions? Okay, so yeah, at a minimum vegetable biodegradable. I would take all this stuff out except vegetable biodegradable oil shall be used in the hydraulic lines on all equipment used on the project site. Uh, no, the contractor is never encouraged to do anything. The contractor shall or, or shall not. Uh, last line I, I take out because contractor doesn't need to know why they're doing something. Like they don't need to know why they're putting rebar in con concrete. Uh, they just need to follow the plan and specs. So decent, decent spec, uh, very clear. No stockpiling below a certain I mean higher high water. And I don't remember what that is, or I would have put the number in. It's better to put the actual uh, elevation in. Um, I think I'm gonna just kind of skip through these. I think I think this is proves my point. Just make it very clear. Here's another straightforward. You know, don't wait until you're done cutting to vacuum, vacuum during cutting operations, which requires a person on the saw and a person on a vacuum. So this is biddable, a contractor knows going into this thing that they're gonna have to have a laborer uh, on a vacuum. And that's the presentation. Um, any more questions before we go? All right. Uh, just a reminder, this will be posted on the chapter YouTube site, which you can reach through the chapter uh, webpage, pnwciec.org. Uh, I'll also post link to the 
to the video through the LinkedIn site or LinkedIn page. So with that, um, I'm going to end the presentation and hope to see you guys in a couple weeks for another one. So thank you all.